Our next session, Neuro Rights, Protecting Brain Data in the Age of Advanced AI, is brought to you in partnership with our media partner, Context. Please welcome Context's Deputy Editor-in-Chief, Barry Malone, to the stage. Hello, good to see you all. Um, as you've just heard from the voice of God, I'm Barry Malone. I'm the Deputy Editor-in-Chief of Context. Um, we're the media partner this year for the Trust Conference. Um, so listen, I worry about my brain. Um, I worry about it in the mornings when, yet again, I get the wrong train. Um, I worry about it when I walk into a room and then I forget why I'm in that room. Um, I worry about it, okay, this one's embarrassing. I worry about it when I open the fridge and for some reason my remote control is in the fridge. I don't know how that would happen. Um, and now I have a whole new worry, and that worry is that tech is being developed that could potentially read my thoughts. Um, it sounds like science fiction, right? But it actually might not be. Um, Context's tech correspondent, Avi Asher Shapiro, has recently looked into this. Um, and right now we're going to show you a film that he made. Um, and then afterwards I'm going to come back up on the stage with Avi and ask him a few questions. So I hope you find it interesting. You can go online right now and order dozens of products that can read your mind. This is not science fiction. It's a multi-billion dollar industry fueled by rapid developments in AI. You can meditate, play video games, and even fly a drone with these things. And it's about to go mainstream. Meta and Apple have patents on this kind of tech, so it might end up on your next pair of headphones or a VR headset. All of these major tech companies are really betting that brain-computer interface will become the way that we interact with all of the rest of our technology. So it's kind of the Wild West right now. You might be getting something from these devices, but they're also getting something from you. Data. Potentially more revealing than anything you've ever shared online. Some are trying to get ahead of things and change laws to protect our minds before we give away too much. Bad enough, we've lost so much privacy. It would be incomparably worse to allow that to happen with our brain activity because there's nothing more. That's it. You've got it. So this is where patients have their brainwave tests done. This is Dr. Sean Pazowski. He spends much of his time studying people's brains. That usually involves expensive and clunky machines like this. How's everything feeling? Which take electrocephalograms, or EEG readings, of your brain waves. But more and more, he's been using this. This has been used in over 200 studies to detect all kinds of things. An over-the-counter device that costs about 300 bucks. Pazowski has used devices like this one in clinical studies with patients suffering from intractable epilepsy. He also uses them at home to meditate. For fun, he tracks his brain waves while he plays the piano. He even got his personal trainer hooked. It helps me stay focused throughout the day and not get caught up with distraction. Pazowski sees these playing a big part in the future of neuro health, and he's not alone. In a recent poll of neuroscientists, most said EEGs will be used to detect seizures or degenerative brain conditions like Alzheimer's within years. Further out, some think it could diagnose mental health conditions and maybe even read our dreams. Is this the one that you'll be able to potentially control an object yeah. on the screen? Yeah. yeah. But the more he used it, the more he got concerned. What does this mean for privacy or autonomy in a world where the biggest tech companies have direct access to our brain? I saw this as a revolution about to begin, um, but there are also these potential pitfalls, and I wanted to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. This sent him on a mission, which led him to lawyers and lawmakers, scientists and industry lobbyists, and eventually to the passing of the first brainwave protection law in the United States. House Bill 1058 is passed. But first, it led him to Rafael Yuste. Yuste is a renowned neuroscientist who had a similar revelation to Pazowski about 10 years earlier. He calls it his Oppenheimer moment. The moment came to him while he was experimenting on the brains of mice. He discovered that using lasers, he could not only detect with incredible accuracy what they were thinking, but also convince them they were seeing images that did not exist. We essentially 
broke into the brain of the mouse and took control over his visual perception. But that night I did not sleep because of the realization that what you can do in a mouse today, you can do in a human tomorrow. My whole life, I never worried about anything but science. That night, I started to worry about the ethical and societal implications of our work. It's not hard to imagine where Yuste's mind went that night. In the wrong hands, mind reading and mind altering devices could have devastating consequences. Think of what a crackdown on dissent could look like if an authoritarian government knew what people were actually thinking. So we launched the NeuroRights Foundation and began working to regulate an industry that is operating with very few guardrails. He's worked with the Chilean government to build brain-related rights into its constitution and launched an advocacy campaign to get lawmakers across the world on board. Earlier this year, the foundation released this report identifying about 30 consumer products and evaluating their privacy policies. Spoiler alert, most of them failed. We found that uh, practically all the companies allow themselves to sell the data to a third party. One of the companies on their list was Neurable. To set it up, it's really simple. You just put them on like a normal pair of headphones. Neurable just released a pair of headphones. They say can help you stay focused and increase your productivity at work. They developed an algorithm that can take your EEG readings using a sensor small enough to fit in here. So this is you reading right here and then you hit that long ad and you can see that it drops down. Its app sort of gamifies this, giving you daily points based on the time you stay focused. It promotes you to do a little bit of work every single day. Neurable CEO, Ramsey Zalcade, envisions a world where neurotech is everywhere. Now imagine football helmets that are able to track traumatic brain injuries. Being able to understand neurodiversity at a deeper level, that's really the type of future that we're starting to create because we're able to monitor things more consistently. He explains that headphone users are given the choice to limit the data they hand over at the expense of some personalized options. Can I use this device and never send my data to you and just use it, have it stay on the headphone, never touch the cloud, and just do this? Absolutely. You can do that. And we did that for the user, yeah. We asked al Qaeda whether his technology could help usher in a dystopian future where companies collect our innermost thoughts. He said that Neurable already operates with the toughest data protection standards, and that existing everyday technology could already draw that kind of intimate picture. You already have your phone with you. You already have cameras on every street. There's infinitely easier ways of that future already existing. The EEG is such a high level signal that it doesn't really add too much to the equation. Some brain privacy advocates see things differently. They say brain data already tells us a lot and we're only at the very, very beginning of decoding it. Take this Australian study from last year. Yes, I'd like a bowl of chicken soup, please. Where a commercial EEG device helped translate a user's thoughts to speech with 40% accuracy. This proves that you can in principle decode language with external devices that you can purchase uh, on the street uh, without any regulation. Beyond language, experts say these readings could indicate deeper emotional states, when you are vulnerable, when you are depressed, when you are lying. And that's what brain sensors suddenly enable, is access to the part that you don't express. This is Nita Farhani, the author of an important book about brain privacy, The Battle for Your Brain. In it, she writes about the value that this extremely personal data could have on the open market. It's entirely possible that companies like Meta will see brain data as being a gold mine to develop new products or to be able to sell to politicians, to be able to access how people are truly reacting to their advertisement. Outside the US, she lists examples of this tech already being used in coercive ways. In Dubai, the police have reportedly forced suspects to wear EEG devices while they are shown images of a crime, looking for signs of recognition in the brain waves. In China, parents revolted against a program that put EEG headsets on elementary school students to monitor their attention throughout the day. So this is the mode of device? Yeah. It's kind of hard to wrap your mind around what's possible here until you try one of these things on. Like that? On top. Yeah, that looks pretty good. After just a few minutes of training, I was able to virtually lift this block. That's nuts. Just by thinking about it. That's crazy. <laughs> that's, a, that's nuts. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I was, but I can see this is like a janky, janky version of something that could get very scary it's very quickly. Modem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a dial-up dial modem of something yeah. that gets. Imagine that. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to conceptualize. Is there some limit to what I could be thinking that this device would just not be able to get to, or is there no limit? There really is no theoretical limit to what the machine can capture if you're telling it what you're doing. Privacy yeah. policy here. Oh, oh. Like, where do I find uh, the privacy policy? See. Where is it? Um. This year, Pazowski worked with the NeuroRights Foundation to lobby for brain privacy protections in the state of California. They're giving away some of this most sensitive data that you could possibly give away to anyone. And Colorado. Very much. You've yeah. appropriately scared all of us. So, all right. <laughs> but they face some industry pushback. We have two critical suggestions remaining on this bill. A trade group representing over 70 companies, including Meta and Apple, tried to limit the definition of brain data in a way that it might not interfere with products they were developing or selling. We want to make sure that this doesn't apply to things like augmented reality, virtual reality, and other technologies that I think we'd all agree are not neural data. It turns out defining neural data is not so easy. In the end, both bills focused on protecting the measurement of brain and neurological activity. That covers EEG devices and also things like Meta's Orion prototype, which uses neurological readings through your wrist. But some think that by limiting laws to neurotech specifically, they miss all sorts of ways that technology could be used to decode our mental states. It's unlikely that that covers the other modalities like eye tracking or um, like facial emotional recognition that is happening with those same devices. Jared Genzer, a lawyer for the NeuroRights Foundation, says there are limits to how far they could push and should push regulators. Saying that every electronic device that we have or interact with is a biosensor and all of that is going to be regulated is just going to be an idea that will be politically dead on arrival. In the meantime, the issue is gaining traction globally. Last year, UNESCO took up the issue. They are working with Farhani to advance an expansive framework, asking governments around the world to adopt privacy rules not just for the brain, but for other biometrics that could be used to infer our mental states. This technology could be incredibly empowering for consumers. I am optimistic that we can get there. The question is whether we can get there fast enough. As soon as these mass market devices end up on the marketplace, it's very difficult to claw back data. It's very difficult to claw back rights. I couldn't be happier about the idea that now I can recommend something to a patient who wasn't able to use this EEG headband before to help them sleep, and it helps me sleep, and I use it. They ought to be protected at the same level as people who come into the hospital and, and use the same technology. This is truly a brave new world of neurotechnology. I would just like to see only the good come out of it. Um, wow, that was super interesting slash mildly terrifying. <laughs> uh, everybody, meet Avi, who you've just seen um, in the film there. Um, I thought you looked very fetching with the contraption on your head. What about this? Um, I, I need to ask, are you okay? Have there been any weird side effects or anything? I'm great, yeah. You're doing okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good to know. Um, it's kind of mind-blowing. Like, when I look at these things and I see the pace at which this technology is moving, um, it's, it's just nuts to me, and this is your sort of day-to-day, -day, right? You're a tech correspondent, you look at this stuff. Do you find it easy to predict or see these things coming down the road? No. <laughs> I think, I mean, you, you see Dr. Pazowski say it in the film that, you know, it feels like we're looking at the dial-up version of a technology, and you know, th there will be an iPhone someday, but, you know, m maybe there isn't. I mean, I think... One of the, the tough things about this is, is trying to project into the future, like especially trying to regulate something when it's you know quite clunky. Uh, you know, I, th I think back to like the late '90s when they first started putting like GPS in cell phones, and it was like kind of a hobbyist thing. You know, I think the company was like Dutch or something that came up with it, and I don't think anyone would have predicted that a couple of decades later 
governments would be like knocking on the door of Google and saying, giving me the location data of every single yeah. person that walked by a crime scene. But that you know, geofencing warrants became like the marquee privacy issue decades later. So trying to figure out what that is for, for, yeah. for brain tech is, yeah, I, I have no idea. And, and you have people who, part, part of being a reporter is talking to people who have vastly different visions for what the future is going to look like, which is fun and, and also confusing. Yeah. Actually, I was going to ask you about that because you had some you had some people in the video who were like incredibly worried about the future, and then I know that there are other people who are like incredibly positive about this technology and think that it can do amazing things for us. Um, can you maybe outline for us a little bit that sort of division of opinion there? Yeah, I mean, so one of the cool things about making something like this is we got to hang out with these like brain scientists who are these, you know, very brilliant people, especially yeah, yeah. for someone like me who, you know, got a B minus in biology. Like it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an incredible experience, but also like I don't have the tools to adjudicate a debate between one PhD neuroscientist and another one who seems to think that we could be going into a very strange 1984 brain tech moment and another who thinks that that's quite unrealistic. I think um, that's, I, I, but that, that was sort of the dynamic of, of working on this, which is a story I've been covering for a couple of years. Um, you have a, a dedicated group of neuroscientists in the, in the Neuro Rights Foundation who are simultaneously really enthusiastic about this technology in, in medicine and wellness and, and really terrified of it in, 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 in areas of commercialization or in law enforcement. Um, and then others who think that basically this technology is, uh, you know, basically the, the privacy, the vector of, again, the, the privacy concerns are really overstated. And so we try to present that, you know, in, in the film and in my reporting on this. But yeah, I mean, I think that if you, like, if you go back to the beginning of the internet in the 80s and, you know, and, and try to predict, you know, if, if what these things are going to turn into, you, 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 you really no one had it right. I think a lot about, like, the big privacy debates of, like, like when I was born in 1988 and, like, the big, debate that year was about like this bill called like the Computer Matching and Privacy Act, I think, in the US, which was like to what happens if the government's gonna compare two databases? Like are they allowed to like do it mm. from if they use a computer? And like that was like the big headline of the year. It's like a big story in the New York Times. Like should the government use computers <laughs> to look at databases, right? And like so uh, you know and in some ways I feel like we're in that moment for this neurotechnology. So I, I, I think we have to be humble in front of it to imagine we can kind of predict what's happening. All right, what's your big takeaway? My big takeaway? Yeah, I, wanna, I know you want to get a B minus. <laughs> you know, you've been reporting on this for a long time. I'd still be super interested in what your takeaway is right now. Yeah, I've been reading this book called The Right to Oblivion, which is oh, yeah. about like the, um, you know, kind of re rethinking the way we think about privacy. And I, so I, I, it's made me think about like, what should we collect as a society? You know, is there, you know, I think that once you start collecting things, you can't really stop, and you kind of lose control of them. And I think, like, I don't know if people have followed what's happened with 23andMe over the last year or so, but, you know, it's just the big, the company that was going to tell us all our ancestry, and it turned out they couldn't make any money because people only need to know that once, and there was no subscription model, which is the only way you can make money, so they're sitting on all this DNA data. And then people were amusing, like, well, maybe they'll sell it to an insurance company that then can figure out that people who might get cancer so they cannot give them insurance, which is like really different than being like, oh, I'm 30% Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, once, you start w w w once you start collecting data, you lose control of it. And so I think that although a lot of these companies working in this space, I think have really noble goals, um, you know, help people focus, help people who are neurodivergent, you know, understand themselves, you know, help people meditate. Once you start collecting this kind of data, I mean, it's going to be really hard to put the, what is it, the toothpaste back in the tube? Yeah, the, yeah. the cat back <laughs> in the like bag? That. Yeah, it, yeah. It's gonna, yeah, so I think that was sort of what was, was going on in the back of my head this whole time. Yeah. Right. Super interesting. Um, don't worry, we're not going to read your brainwaves at the Trust Conference. It's, it's fine. You can, you're safe. All right, great. Thank you, Abby. Thank yeah, you so yeah, much. Yeah, thanks. Still, thanks for watching. There's supposed to be a QR code, I think, that you guys can scan, but I don't see it. Um, here we go. Okay, so if you scan that QR code, it's going to take you to some of Avi's writing on this um, topic. And while you're there, while you're on context.news, please do, please do check us out. We cover uh, climate change, uh, the impact of tech on society, and the need for more inclusive economies. So 
We would love it if you guys became regular readers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you just walk up. Yeah. Yeah.